Hello. Welcome back to the Space Glow. Today we're gonna find out what would have happened had the Bad Batch saved Depa Balaba. This won't have any spoilers for season two of Bad Batch. This was written before season two came out, but it is coming out for Bad Batch's new release. Before we begin, special thanks to our patrons, voice actors, and everyone else part of my team. What a chance to win in our next giveaway. Watch the end of the video, tell you exactly how you can win a free lightsaber. Our story begins on the snowy world of Collar. Tech reported to his fellow members of the Bad Batch and to General Balaba that the Clone Wars were nearing their end. Encrypted code from Clone Trooper Com Chatter was reporting that Jedi General Obi-Wan Kenobi had engaged General Grievous on Utapau. It seemed as if the Clone Wars were soon to be over. The Bad Batch suggested to General Balaba that they push their forces forward and advance being that the reinforcements were locked up. Balaba would send her young student, Caleb Doom, forward with the Bad Batch until moments later, her captain started acting differently. He took a message and she heard the words Execute Order 66. Captain Grey turned around and lifted his blaster and fired at his Jedi General. She ignited her lightsaber and cut across his blaster, disarming him, and using the force to throw him from his feet. Around her, the remaining clones lifted up their blasters. The Bad Batch stopped in their tracks immediately, as they turned around, noticing the clones change in their behavior. Hunter told his men to set their weapons for stun as they ran back towards Depa, getting in front of Caleb Doom to protect the student. Hunter ran forward, as did Tech and Echo. They began to shoot stun rounds at the clone troopers. The clones were completely blindsided by this, as the few who noticed turned their attention away from Depa as she continued to defend herself. Wrecker looked at Caleb in a confused manner. Wrecker wasn't exactly brilliant, so he didn't jump on the clone's behavior as fast as Hunter, Tech, and Echo did. But he did notice Crosshair next to Caleb, readying his weapon. Wrecker leapt forward tackling his brother to the ground, asking what he was doing. Crosshair just admitted a quiet, good soldiers follow orders, back to Wrecker. The massive Bad Batch member asked him what he was talking about. Behind him, Hunter, Echo, and Tech looked at the regs as they got down to Depa after making sure she was alright. Depa, while confused, was wise enough to determine that the Bad Batch was not her enemy. She called out to Caleb and got him next to her, and then she noticed that the Bad Batch wasn't exactly all on the same page about whatever orders had just come in from the Chancellor. Hunter noticed and told Echo to take General Balaba and Caleb back to the Marauder. Hunter and Tech ran over to Crosshair and Wrecker and demanded to know what was going on, but Crosshair continued the same chant, good soldiers follow orders, good soldiers follow orders. Hunter started speaking to Crosshair but he seemed to have no response to it. Tech ran up and pointed a light in Crosshair's eyes and said that there seemed to be nothing wrong with him. Tech theorized there was something acting wrong with him, maybe some sort of bug. Tech stunned Crosshair and wrapped a breathing apparatus around his head that would pump a sedating air into his lungs to make sure that he stayed passed out. Tech requested that Wrecker take Crosshair and place him in the back of the ship until Tech could work on him. Wrecker picked up Crosshair and threw him over his shoulder, and Hunter took his weapons and carried them. The three of them would make their way back to the Marauder, and Hunter would make his way to the cockpit and take off. Echo was sitting in the cockpit of the ship waiting for Hunter, informing him that they would become blacklisted once the other clones woke up. Hunter acknowledged this, but he still said that he would take the ship to Kamino, as they took the ship into space and jumped into hyperspace towards Kamino. When Hunter went back to the back of the ship, he started talking to Depa, asking her what had just happened with the clone troopers back there. She was at a loss for words, and she was currently consoling her student, who seemed to be reacting negatively to the situation. Who would blame him? Depa told Hunter that she heard Captain Grey take an order, and then she heard him say something about the execution of some sort of order with a, with a number of some sorts. She never heard the exact number combination before, and then she said that her captain acted as if he were controlled. Tech turned around and asked if he seemed robotic. She nodded her head. Tech admitted that he had a theory. He knew for a fact that the regs had inhibitor chips inside of them. These chips were simply meant to keep the clones in line, suggesting that they were the only reason they didn't go off inside the Bad Batch members was because they were outfitted differently than the regs. Their natural differences to the regs of the clone army was likely the cause of their chips not working. And then Tech theorized that what happened to function inside of Crosshair for whatever reason was possibly being of his insane accuracy didn't diminish the chip's activists entirely. Hunter asked if the chip could be removed, to which Tech admitted that it could be removed, but the issue is he didn't exactly know where the chip was. If he messed up on the procedure, then the chances are that it could be fatal to Crosshair or any of the other Bad Batch members. Tech told Hunter that if he had some time and had the facilities of a Republic Medical Bay, then he could likely change the inhibitor chip or simply remove it entirely. Though upon reflection, Tech believed that the Bad Batch should work on removing all their inhibitor chips and 
sudden fear that they could be activated. Hunter asked Tech where they should go instead of Kamino them, to which Tech said bluntly, wherever they could access a Republic-styled medical bay without the possibility of harming the General and her Padawan. Hunter looked over to Depa and asked her what she would like them to do. Truthfully, Depa realized that her jurisdiction as a Jedi General had come to an end. Now, she was an outcast. She connected the dots. If Captain Grey got the orders, then surely the larger legions of the clone armies got those same orders. She could also feel it through the Force, the distress across the Republic and across the galaxy, Jedi turning to see their men ready to kill them without provocation. Depa told Hunter that there was one place that would be great for them to go. She could possibly link up with some other Jedi Council members and they could go their own separate ways. But that was only possible if those Jedi Council members survived the Purge. Echo spoke up asking where this location was, to which she said it was the medical facilities on Polis Massa. Tech turned around and told everyone that it would be the perfect place for them to hide, to find a location of the inhibitor chip, and then remove it from each of them. Echo pulled the chip out of hyperspace over Kamino, and then redirected its course to Polis Masa. Hunter asked the question though, if there weren't any other council members left at Polis Masa, what would Depa do? She thought about it for a moment, and then told Hunter that she had considered it, but she would have an answer for him if that were the case. After some time of Tech rummaging around looking for the inhibitor chips, he found something that he believed would be the chip, but he wasn't entirely sure. Luckily, they had arrived over Polis Masa. Echo informed everyone that there was a senator ship from Naboo that was on the planet for some reason. Depa's immediate reaction was it was possibly Kenobi, maybe even Skywalker. Being that Skywalker was on course and at the end of the war, it was very possible that he and the senator got out because, well, he protected the senator at the beginning of the war and she was simply repaying him a favor. Nothing deeper than that. Though when they arrived and exited the vessel, Depa didn't feel the force from anyone on the planet. On the other hand, Wrecker carried Crosshair to one of the local medical bays. Depa was rather disappointed, but she began to search the complex with her student, though she didn't find any sign of Jedi or the Senator from Naboo. She was very confused. She had every reason to believe that there would at least be the Senator of Naboo being present, being that it was her personal vessel, but that was apparently wrong. On the other side of the complex, Hunter and Tech tied Crosshair down to a medical bay. Tech got to work immediately, pulling all the medical tools he could use to his side so he could scan Crosshair's head and try to get an understanding of what he was working with. Truthfully, Tech couldn't figure out to begin with. He had a hunch on the ship, but it turns out it was a wrong thing. Hunter asked Tech if it was a robotic chip, and then Tech snapped his fingers, telling Hunter that it wasn't. Hunter looked at Tech with confusion, to which Tech told him that it wasn't a robotic chip at all. It couldn't be, because it would be identifiable to the Jedi. It's likely the Kaminoans created a biological chip to mimic brain tissue so that it couldn't be accidentally discovered. Echo walked forward with a tablet from the ship, reporting that there was a case of a trooper from the 501st earlier in the year that had his chip activated. Though Nala Say, the chief medical officer of Kamino, had created a series of holograms and saved them, revealing that Clone Trooper Tup's inhibitor chip went off early, and per request of the Chancellor, they kept it under everything, under wraps, so that the Jedi couldn't figure out its true intention. She continued saying that they would all roll out a blank inoculation for what they convinced the Jedi was a rare bug from Ringo Vinda. Echo stopped, and then asked Tech why his inhibitor chip didn't activate. Tech whipped around and subtly said that Echo's brain was likely damaged from the experiments on Skako Minor, and the chances of his inhibitor chip working were probably most likely deactivated, stating that from a scientific perspective, Echo was more machine than man. Echo sighed. It wasn't exactly relieving to hear that, but he turned around to see Depa. She looked rather defeated, a rare sight to see in a Jedi Master. She didn't exactly show it to her student, but Echo had seen the same look before in Master Kenobi's eyes when they had to bury Master Even Peel after rescuing him from the Citadel. Though truthfully, Kenobi was much better off than Depa in that moment because his order wasn't gone. Depa's eyes reflected those of someone who had just lost everything, and was panicked because she had to not just worry about her own safety and survival, but the safety and survival of her student. While on a Jedi level, it most certainly didn't have the same bond or connection, every master-student relationship was paternal or maternal in some way, shape, or form. Tech told everyone except Echo to leave the room. He was going to work on Crosshair and remove the inhibitor chip, but he needed silence. Truthfully, Echo was willing to help but he informed Tech that his mind was currently a little distracted, wondering if Rex, Jesse, Vaughn, and Apo executed Skywalker and Tano. In all honesty, Echo forgot that Ahsoka had been essentially forced out of the Jedi Order, and was simply under the assumption that she was still 
with Anakin. This stuck on Echo's mind, but Tech requested that while Echo had feelings for his former friends, he needed to be here in this moment for his squad mate. There was nothing he could change about the outcome they now faced, or what happened to his friends. It was over and done with, and while that may have been cruel to hear, it was the truth. Tech apologized for the bluntness, but he needed Echo to be here in the moment right now. Echo got himself together and got ready as the two of them began the procedure. Tech told Echo that he theorized the chip to be here, but he needed to be sure, tilting Crosshair's head ever so slightly, and then requesting one of the medical droids to open up a three-dimensional readout of Crosshair's head. The droid did, and Tech looked at everything, opening up a hologram on his wrist that showed the genetic template for the clone army's head biometric scan. Echo asked what he was doing. Tech simply replied that he was comparing Crosshair's brain readouts to the Django Fett template for brain readout. Echo asked how he got that, to which Tech simply remarked that it was in the database accessible to everyone on Kamino. Being that the Django Fett template had no inhibitor chip, chances are the Kaminoans had it on file to show the Jedi if they were ever caught, just to show that there was no issues with the regs. Tech stopped in his tracks and highlighted a particular area on both brain scans. Echo excitedly responded, saying that it looked like the inhibitor chip was present there. Tech nodded his head, twisting Crosshair's head ever so slightly back to the other side and requesting that the medical droid make a precise incision. The droid hesitated, saying that there was currently nothing wrong with the patient, to which Echo remarked that it was an inhibitor chip that wasn't supposed to be in the brain. The droid looked at both the clones and then acknowledged their concerns by requesting they turn to the side, that it would be a gory incision for just about a moment. The clones turned their heads, and a moment later, the droid was wiping a little bit of blood away from Crosser's head, and then placing a Bacta patch in its place. Tech told the droid that it needed to have the same exact procedure ready to do a couple more times. Echo asked if he would need the procedure done, to which Tech told him it wasn't at all necessary. Hunter walked into the room and asked if the chip was in the same location for every trooper, to which Tech responded with a snarky remark about the Kaminoans not being wise enough or motivated enough to do so and place it in different places. They were a lazy scientist by his calculations, and it was evident by their genetic work. Hunter asked what he meant as Tech pushed Hunter to a nearby table and told him he didn't have time to go into it. As all the clones got their inhibitor chips removed, Deppa and Caleb talked about what they would like to do from here on out. Caleb was really worried, but Deppa assured him that everything would be fine. She suggested that they would go into hiding, to which she would complete his training, and then from there, they would have to exist in the galaxy alone. Deppa was very wise, but much like every other Jedi in the galaxy, she had nowhere to go but into hiding. The clone army was far too large to go anywhere. Deppa then thought of something. She took Caleb back to the Marauder and reached for something. She brought inside of the Marauder before. She told Caleb that she was going to give it to him. It had lightsaber techniques saved on it by Master Skywalker. Caleb still saw Anakin as a Jedi Master, being that Ahsoka was trained by him and he was pretty much classmates with Ahsoka. Caleb also thought of it as a respectful way to address Skywalker. Deppa knelt down and asked Caleb to do the same on the opposite side of her. The two knelt down and closed their eyes as Deppa opened it up. It seemed as if the holocron had been received a transmission from the Jedi Temple. It started with this. This is Master Obi-Wan Kenobi. I regret to inform that both the Jedi Order and the Republic have fallen to the dark shadow of the Empire, rising to take their place. This message is a warning and a reminder for any surviving Jedi. Trust in the Force. Do not return to the Temple. That time has passed, and our future is uncertain. We will each be challenged, our trust, our faith, our friendships, but we all must perceive, and in time, a new hope will emerge. May the Force be with you, always. Deppa took a deep breath. A heavy chill ran down her spine as she looked up at Caleb. His face was noticeably shook. He couldn't believe that everything was lost. Deppa was just truthfully happy to hear that Obi-Wan survived, but she was also worried about what the future held for them. As Master Kenobi said, though, they must trust in the Force. Deppa held an optimistic feeling towards the future and training of her student, and she told Caleb that they should probably stay with these clones. They were now outcasts too, and the more allies they had, the better they were. She could also offer up guidance to them if they needed it. The Marauder was small, but hopefully, the Bad Batch wouldn't mind keeping them along with them. The two Jedi walked back to the medical facility. Hunter had just woken up and Crosshair was currently waking up. Hunter asked Crosshair if he knew how he was feeling. Crosshair just shook his head and admitted he was unsure. He didn't feel any different, just confused as to why he had a massive headache. 
Eventually, the rest of the squad woke up, and there seemed to be no issues with any of them. Hunter and Deppa had been talking while they waited for the rest of the squad to wake up. Hunter offered Deppa and Caleb room on the Marauder. He said the same thing Deppa did without realizing, believing that they would be better off with more allies than less. This would be true for multiple months. Thanks to Deppa and thousands of Republic credits she had, she was able to afford residence on a backwater outer rim world. Enough room for the clones, too. Though the Bad Batch would have start taking up work as essentially mercenaries to do the work that paid them. It would allow them to take care of their vessel and also help fund their living costs. Caleb and Deppa would also spend time with the Bad Batch helping them out with their several missions. Though the truth is, Deppa was as much concerned with keeping Caleb hidden from the travesties unfolding across the galaxy. It was a tense period for everyone, and once the Empire began to stretch its arms out across the galaxy, everything got more tense. The Empire was very focused on locking down everything, and thanks to the Marauder, the Bad Batch was able to sneak past enemy lines and make their presence known where they needed to be. The Bad Batch didn't have any intentions of messing with the Empire until they were requested to go and save another clone trooper by the name of Gregor. He was captured by the Empire after deciding he didn't want to work for them anymore. The Bad Batch was able to save him and they released him out into the galaxy, yet another ally for the Rebels to have. Sadly, there wasn't a case of Saul Guerrero. Tarkin wanted him dead, and the first squad of troopers he sent to hunt him down found him and killed his band of Rebels. When Deppa wasn't with the Bad Batch or training Caleb, she was worrying about the other Jedi in the galaxy, especially Master Kenobi, who she knew was alive, considering she had no reason to believe that Yoda had survived. Deppa believed that the entire council had been killed and Obi-Wan left a message to the survivors of the Purge. Though how he made it from Utapau to the Jedi Temple without being killed, she didn't really know how to understand. Not that she was going to complain about one of the Order's best Jedi surviving. Deppa wasn't by any means a Jedi who went out of the box. She was very by the books and so she had the idea of her doing something rambunctious was completely out of the picture. Her student being, well, Caleb, was more interested in joining the Bad Batch on their numerous missions across the galaxy. He believed he was missing out on a lot, but truthfully, he had a nice friendship with Wrecker and Echo. With the Clone Wars being ended so rapidly and the execution of the Jedi coming by even quicker, Deppa wasn't exactly willing to risk her student's life. Every master had to deal with this, they couldn't imagine losing their student, and that was the same for Deppa. The same paternal-maternal feelings surfaced and made her believe that nothing could be worse than risking the life of her student. While she did believe in Caleb, the galaxy was too tense, and if what the Bad Batch said was true about the Empire, then the Empire was going to have new troopers, non-clone troopers, ready to kill the Jedi on sight, called Stormtroopers. Deppa meditated. She believed that she had a greater purpose. There had to be something that she could do, believing that if the Bad Batch hadn't been there, her and Caleb would have died. That's part of the reason that Caleb didn't hold resentment towards his teacher for restricting him on going out. But every time she left, he stressed too. Could it be the last time he saw her? Because when he turned around during Order 66, he thought she was going to die. It's something he never wanted for her. He never wanted her to go through again. Though years would begin to go by, the Bad Batch would become known as one of the most renowned forces against the Empire. Their names would be at the top of hit lists, which would be a bit daunting considering bounty hunters like Cad Bane existed. But even bounty hunters had their limits. Cad Bane would go after the Bad Batch on behalf of not the Empire, rather he was hired by the Keminoans. But once Topoka City sunk into the bottom of the Keminoan Sea, there was no reason for him to follow the bounty, because the time he had had come and gone to get paid. Cad Bane wasn't the only one tasked with hunting the Bad Batch, but he certainly was the worst of the bunch. He was tasked to go after them because the Keminoans wanted him to ensure their cloning technology. It had been four years since the Clone Wars came to a rapid end, and the Bad Batch had just found out that one of the Jedi Masters from the era of the Republic had been discovered at the Spire in Stagon Prime. When Hunter brought this information to Deppa, she wasn't hesitant to jump at the opportunity to save another Jedi Master. Tech informed her about the readouts of the Spire from a clone that had recently left the Empire, something that was becoming ever more so frequent within the ranks of the Empire were clone deserters. The Bad Batch had many encounters with clone troopers that began to resent the Empire, and even their own actions from Order 66. While it wasn't under their control, many Clone Wars vets became beggars sitting in the street corners, getting dust kicked into their face without any regard for who they are or who they were and what they'd fought for. The price to pay for the deaths of thousands. Regardless, Caleb was extremely excited to join Depp on this mission, but she informed him that they would be going it alone. Caleb was rather hurt by this, 
but in a way, he still understood. Deppa wanted him safe, assuming that the Jedi Master was going to be guarded by the best the Empire had. Plus, Deppa believed that her and the Bad Batch would be able to handle the situation alone. The Bad Batch would take the Marauder out the stag on Prime, and within a number of hours they would land outside the facility, landing on the side of a mountain next to the spire. The squad climbed up the side of the mountain, and Echo made his way from the droid port and unlocked the door. When the door shot open, it was silent. Deppa could feel the presence of someone strong with the Force. It seemed as if the Jedi Master was alive. Deppa and the Bad Batch rolled into the corridor, and they kept their eyes peeled around every corner. Deppa closed her eyes. She could feel the Jedi Master's cell. It was down the hall. Hunter ran down and covered her. He kept his eyes open while Crosshair, Tech, Echo, and Wrecker ran to the end of the hall. Crosshair caught up with the clones, as Tech stated, tapping away at the Spire's main computer. He reported that the Jedi Master was up three floors and down the hall to the left. The Bad Batch and Depa piled into the elevator and waited. While in there, Hunter told the group that they needed to be quick. Once they took the Jedi out, it's possible that she could be injured, wounded, or tortured. Wrecker was able to carry her if they needed to, while everyone was able to clear a path if they needed to. They would have to get back to the Marauder and bail before the Empire could finish them off. A simple, coherent plan is all they needed, and that seemed to be it. The door opened and Wrecker and Hunter leapt out of the elevator. Their blasters were aimed at opposite ends of the hallway. Empty. Deppa jumped out with Tech, Echo, and Crosshair. The silence was eerie, but it would be fine. They all ran down the hallway and opened it up. They got inside the room, and they found the Jedi Master. She was quiet. Too quiet. She looked at everyone and stood up. Deppa asked if she was alright, but there was no response. Deppa called out the Jedi's name, asking Master... Luminara Unduli if she was alright, and then a chill was sent down Deppa's back. It wasn't Unduli, it was something else. Deppa ignited her lightsaber as she watched Luminara pass into a holding chamber like a ghost, and then the apparition was revealed to be a hologram. Luminara was long dead. The clones in the room jumped back, asking what it was. Deppa looked at them and told them that it was a trap, not that they didn't assume by Luminara being obviously so dead. Deppa whipped her head around, igniting her lightsaber and running out of the room. She turned her head. It was empty. A sign of relief passed through her body until she turned the other way and saw a walking shadow. The lights then turned off and the escape routes were blocked. Deppa yelled for Tech and demanded that he open the door on the far side of the hallway. He nodded and turned his flashlight on as Deppa pushed him in the right direction. The rest of the clones came out. They could see Deppa because of her lightsaber, but there was nothing else they could see until they turned on their flashlights. She told the clones that she would hold off whoever or whatever this was until they could escape, expressing that they needed to focus on getting out of the spire. Deppa turned her head back to an empty hallway, only hearing the sounds of heavy breathing and the crunching of metallic boots as they inched their way forward. Deppa called out asking who it was, but the voice simply responded telling Master Balaba that she made a terrible mistake by coming for her Jedi friend. A crimson lightsaber opened up just feet away from Deppa, and she panicked and ducked back as a heavy swing ripped through the wall, sweeping down next to her. Deppa jabbed forward, barely missing the figure. The clones at the end of the hallway turned around and began to fire, though none of this would be effective. Deppa, having been taught by Windu, was a fine duelist, but the heavy strikes made from this beast were too much even for her. Each strike got heavier than the last. Every time Deppa parried or blocked, she was nearly thrown from her feet. Truthfully, it was an absolute struggle for Deppa. She was swift to get back to her footing after each strike. This monster landed on her with her lightsaber. Deppa was losing ground quickly, and Tech and Echo combined their struggle to open up the security door. Their panic set in, as blaster fire and the two lightsabers opened up in the hallway, allowing for visibility. Deppa was then knocked off of her feet by the beast. She looked up, and the clones covered her by firing at him, trying to knock him off balance, but this proved to no avail. Wrecker and Hunter were lifted up by the Force while they tried to provide cover for Deppa. They slid across the floor as the monster swung violently down, crushing down against Deppa's blade. Deppa's lightsaber fell out of her hand and she fell back. Crosshair called to the other clones, to which Tech and Echo turned around and they all started firing, but the blaster bullet stopped in midair without being able to move. The crimson lightsaber then left the hand of the monster and whipped around the room, cutting through the walls and then the entire bad batch. Echo and Crosshair were immediately killed when the lightsaber made contact with them. Hunter's leg was cut off, and Wrecker was cut through the stomach, and Tech's arm left missing before the blade returned to the monster's hand. He released his grip on the blaster bolt, sending them back towards the members of the Bad Batch. Tech and Wrecker were immediately hit and killed. The monster stepped forward, hearing Deppa cry out for the members of her squad. Hunter groaned in pain before he was lifted off of his feet. Vader then put a heavy boot on Deppa's throat. 
while she was on the ground. He told her that her effort was valiant, but not even a council member could deny the fate of the Jedi. Hunter's neck was snapped with the force, and then Vader held his lightsaber before jabbing it down through Deppa's face. He turned around and left as the lights returned, showing yet another case of an optimistic Jedi failing to save a Jedi that had long been dead. The clones stationed on the spire would have to get back to work and clean up the mess that was made again. The Marauder would be ripped off the mountain stripped for parts before being deposited in some backwater world. Sadly, Caleb would never learn of what happened to his friends or to his master. It was a struggle for him, but after waiting for months without their return, he felt lost. He didn't know what to do, so he left the communication device behind if they were ever to return. And so, he made his way out to the galaxy. Truthfully, not much would change. Caleb would change his name to Kanan Jarrus. But after several years alone on the journey of a lifetime, he would eventually run into Harris and Dula and Gorse, and he would join the Ghost Squadron. When the time eventually came around for him to train Ezra, he would certainly be more prepared, and Ezra would grow from it. Though the ending for Kanan would be through self-sacrifice on Lothal, and the disappearance of his student with Grand Admiral Thrawn would come at the end of the Battle of Lothal as well. The galaxy would eventually be saved by a bunch of no-names, Han Solo, Leia Organa, and Luke Skywalker in the fight against the Empire on Endor, only for the New Republic to crush the Imperial Remnant at Jakku. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jonathan, Pimp Daddy, Bane, Icy Raptor, Apollo, Mad Men, Studios, Anakin 003, Sense for Bird, and Flynn Vren Seas for supporting the channel. Hit thousand likes on this video. I don't know what's coming next, but it is. If you want to see what if, let me know below. I'll read all your comments, but I don't do crossovers. Check out the Twitch, community, Discord, and Patreon for more in other ways. Check out my other channels. They're all listed right here. If you want a chance to win a free lightsaber, go down below. There's a doc. Click on the doc. Write your name on the doc. We are going for 50,000 subscribers, so smash that subscribe button. We're almost there. I want to give away three lightsabers before I move away in three weeks. So I think we can do it. We're really pushing for it. So let's keep smashing that subscribe button. I really want to give those lightsabers away. And let's talk about the story. So, um, my only, so firstly, uh, first thing I'm going to say is my only critique of like the Bad Batch and the Mandalorian is that there's a lot of side quests. Now you're going to understand where I'm coming from. So the big gap in the middle of the story is because I don't want to do side quests. I don't want you to feel like every every little uh, like journey for them is pointless. I want you to feel like like something's being accomplished. Like for example, in season two of uh, Mandalorian, his entire purpose was getting uh, Grogu to the man uh, to to Luke or to a Jedi essentially. To Luke is basically where we go. Um, but we had to do like eight episodes of side quests until we got there. I wanted to avoid doing that here. Uh, I'm not a big fan of side quests in, in shows or TV. I don't watch much TV, but um, I'm not a fan of side quests. I just think it's kind of lazy writing, in my own opinion. Uh, and that's my one critique of those two shows. So I didn't want to include that here. Uh, so I, I put a big gap in the middle of the story for that purpose. It's four years of side quests type of stuff that you don't really care about that that's going to go on. Essentially season one and two of Bad Batch, but add a Jedi to it. Um, the original ending for, for Depa though was much different. Uh, she was actually going to fill Kanan's role, uh, but truth is, uh, the way I feel about it is not every detail going into a story has to drastically change the universe. Um, because Depa's great, don't get me wrong, I really do like Depa, but she's not someone who can, unless she, unle unless she interacts with the Skywalkers, can really change the trajectory of the galaxy. Uh, now why, why I wanted to do it the way I did it is, again, because I, I like, like, I like the idea of doing a small story. If you guys haven't seen the Rogue One story, it's kind of like that. It's like, these characters aren't the main characters, but they can fill a role. It's like, telling a greater story within the story of Star Wars. What I think Andor does a great job at doing. Um, what I think Obi-Wan Kenobi does a really solid, solid job at doing. Is, is putting a character into the story of Star Wars, and especially with Andor, and kind of letting a story unfold without, like directly impacting the story as we know it. Obviously at some point it's going to cross paths with the story as in Rogue One from Andor's perspective or A New Hope from Obi-Wan's perspective, but in the story that we're learning it doesn't directly correlate with what we know is going to happen. And that's kind of what I wanted to happen here. Is like even if Depa survived, unless she goes to Lethal and saves Kanan, then nothing really changes. And truthfully, not to say that she's bad, but I don't think she's going to get that far. I think it would just be some error like Liss, where, where they would find out that Luminara was still alive, they'd go to save her, and instead of be, being the Grand Inquisitor, it's Darth Vader and he's ready, you know? And here's the importance of the Vader scene. Now, I know a lot of critique that comes on my channel is for killing off Anakin, and truthfully, it doesn't bother me. Um, I'm making a point when I do that. I know a lot of Star Wars fans don't like it when I do that, but I'm making a point. When I make a story, no one's invincible. 
Um, but in this story, Vader is essentially invincible. Think of the end of Fallen Order, where he's like fighting uh, Cal Kestis, and there's literally nothing you could do except for run. That's this, and that's what I wanted it to be. Because in a story with Anakin in it, where, where Anakin plays a, a major role, or Darth Vader plays a major role, I don't want him to feel invincible, because whether the Chosen One prophecy exists or not, I don't really care. It's, it's, it's a what-if story, and it's meant to change something, and it's meant to be this character can't just be invincible. I know that's something that some of the larger what if channels, or I guess not really a what if channel, but you know what I'm talking about, doesn't really make Anakin a character that can be possibly damaged. And that's something I always want to highlight. So the importance of the scene here is like, I don't hate Anakin. I don't. I love Anakin. I think he's a great character. But when I write Anakin out of a story or I write Anakin into being killed in a story, I, I really am emphasizing that he's not invincible, that no one is invincible. But this story, and this story in particular, Vader is invincible. He's not losing to Depa. Uh, Depa's a great duelist, and yes, being trained by Windu, she's going to be great. But he is, he's not losing to Depa. Or he's not losing to Depa, yeah. He's not losing to Depa. So, anyways, I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope you see where I'm coming from with this. Um, and, and kind of the cool, the cool idea of like, like how how things can change in one part of the story but the story itself stays continuous uh, like the canon version of the story stays continuous um so anyways i hope you all enjoyed um if you did smash that like button subscribe you know what we're doing giveaway i want to give away those lightsabers three lightsabers before let's try and get it let's try and do it before january 21st let's shoot for that that would be awesome anyways i love you all spread the love and always remember my friends may the force be with you